Welcome to the NERACUS Integrated Nutrient Observatory webinar series. This is the uh, third and final webinar of this series. My name is Tom Scheika. I'm with NERACUS, and I'll be providing an introduction to the project and moderating questions today. The purpose of this webinar series uh, is to share the results of our Nutrient Observatory project. Uh, in the first two web webinars, we um, shared some data uh, from the project from various locations where the sensors were deployed. Uh, the webinar today is going to focus on a uh, description of the sensor deployed. Uh, you'll hear about some of the challenges and lessons learned in operating the sensors, and we'll show you how to access uh, project data. So I first want to start with a, a brief overview of Miracus and our project. NIRACUS is part of the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System, or the U.S. IUS. Uh, the IUS consists of 11 regional associations. You can see the map of the regional associations. Uh, there is also a U.S. IUS program office that is housed in NOAA, uh, and the program consists of a partnership of at least 17 federal agencies, and there are many more partnerships at the regional level. NERACUS is the Northeastern Regional Association of Coastal Ocean Observing Systems. And NERACUS serves the region uh, shown in this map. And the NERACUS mission is to produce, integrate, and communicate high quality information that helps ensure safety, economic and environmental resilience, and sustainable use of the coastal ocean. NERACUS is a partnership of many organizations as well. Uh, this image shows many of the partners who design, develop, maintain, and operate the various elements of the observing system in this region. This includes a network of oceanographic buoys, coastal radar systems, ocean forecast systems, water level sensors, gliders, and a data management system uh, for providing access to the data uh, through various products and services. Now I want to give you an introduction to the Integrated Nutrient Observatory Project. Our goal was to develop an integrated nutrient observatory within NERACUS, capable of resolving nutrient dynamics at temporal and spatial scales necessary to address critical needs of stakeholders throughout the Northeast region. The uh, partners in this project were Seabird Scientific, the University of Rhode Island, University of New Hampshire, the University of Connecticut, the University of Maine, and the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. There had been uh, several successful shorter-term deployments of automated nutrient sensors in this region before, but there was no network of sensors intended to be deployed long-term as part of an operational observing system. And that's what we were trying to achieve with this project. This project was funded by the IUS Ocean Technology Transition Program, also known as the OTT program which sponsors the transition of emerging marine observing technologies for which there is an existing operational requirement and a demonstrated commitment to integration and use by the ocean observing community to operational mode. Uh, typical OTT projects involve a partnership between a regional association or multiple regional associations, academic institutions, and private sector companies like Seabird Scientific that have developed a sensor or technology that is being transitioned into operation. I have a link at the bottom of this slide where you can learn more about the uh, IUS OTT program. You could also just Google IUS and OTT, and that'll bring you right there. The um, IUS program office has uh, indicated that there will likely be a, another OTT call for proposals uh, later this year. So a little more specifics about our project, the nutrient sensors. Now you're gonna learn a lot more about the nutrient sensors today, but I just want to mention that uh, the sensors that were chosen for this project were the Seabird Scientific Sensors, the SUNA nitrate sensor, and the cycle phosphate. We did start out with a cycle ammonium uh, sensor in this project, but Seabird determined they would not be able to support that sensor for this project. So the focus is really on the, the nitrate and the phosphate sensor. This map showed where we uh, deployed the nutrient sensors on existing buoys. You can see that we included various estuarine locations, such as Long Island Sound, Narragansett Bay, and Great Bay, New Hampshire. 
as well as the coastal waters of the Gulf of Maine. This project really leveraged that existing uh, buoy and mooring infrastructure and all the expertise at the partner institutions who learned how to operate the sensors, uh, integrate the sensors into their uh, mooring systems or their stations, um, and transmit the data and integrate the data streams into our system. That's really where the bulk of the activity for this project was. Uh, stakeholder engagement was another important component of this project uh, to make stakeholders aware of the data that was being collected uh, so we can begin to understand how that data will be used and help us determine how to display and provide access to the data. Uh, this was accomplished through workshops, uh, presentations at various stakeholder meetings, individual discussions. Uh, also, this webinar series is a part of our engagement activities, uh, which we will continue. The official OTT project uh, has ended, and many of these sensors are being transitioned into operations in near Coos with support from IUS and also the EPA. Um, and we've had a three-part webinar series. The first webinar uh, presented um, data that was collected in the Gulf of Maine and Long Island Sound. The second webinar uh, focused on data collected in Great Bay, New Hampshire and Narragansett Bay. And those two uh, webinars are available to view on our website. And the third and final webinar today is gonna focus on presenting information about the sensors that were used, some of the lessons learned from operating these sensors, and then some information about how to access the data collected in this project. So all of the uh, participants are on mute, but please feel free to send in questions uh, using the um, GoToWebinar toolbox. Uh, there should be a little uh, question arrow where you can submit questions, and we'll take as many of those questions as we can. And so now I want to go to our first presentation about the nutrient sensors. And we have two presenters. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Andrew Barnard, who is Chief Technology Officer for Seabird Scientific, leading technology and product innovation efforts at the company. Uh, Dr. Barnard received his PhD in oceanography from Oregon State University. Did his postdoctoral work with Dr. Colin Rosler at Bigelow Laboratories. We worked on integration of optical and biological sensors for the Gulf of Maine Ocean Observing System. During his tenure with Seabird and Scientific, Dr. Barnard has led several new product development efforts, including the cycle hydrophosphate, I'm sorry, cycle hydrocycle phosphate sensor. Dr. Barnard has a background and interest in physical biological interactions in the euphotic zone, coastal ocean observing systems, optical properties and relationships to biogeochemical variability and ocean color remote sensing applications. Also presenting with um, Dr. Barnard will be Andrew Dutton. Uh, he started his career in oceanography in 2005, working as a calibration lab field technician for an international NGO whose mission was gathering atmospheric and sea surface data as part of the World Meteorological Organization's Vessel of Opportunity Program. Adam joined Seabird in 2010 as and has worked extensively with Seabird's engineers to develop new sensors and improve product performance uh, for many products, including Seabird's Scientific's nutrient sensors. Adam manages a team of technologists and scientists who provide support for Seabird's global customer base through phone and email, also conducting trainings, field testing, and demonstration deployments. His customer contact and field experience in turn provide critical feedback to the company on the sensors, their successes and challenges, and varying applications around the world. We'll now turn it over to Andrew and Adam. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and share uh, some of the experiences in uh, the NERACUS uh, Nutrient Observatory Project. Um, we're going to uh, split our talk into two components, a component that focus more on what our uh, deliverables were, what the sensors were, what the uh, some of the goals and objectives were from Seabird Scientific's uh, participation. Uh, I'll be presenting that. Uh, I'll then hand it off to Adam, who will provide a uh, review of how the 
uh, servicing and how the uh, experience and feedback we got from the operators, uh, which was a very rich uh, interaction and very rich experience to get to work with all the operators um, in understanding how uh, the sensors are, uh, are used and were the challenges faced on putting them on into an observatory. Uh, so let's start off with the next slide. Um, the deliverables from Seabird Scientific were, uh, as Tom mentioned, to provide uh, some nitrate and phosphate sensors to the observatory. <clears throat> um, in particular, our Stunis uh, optical nitrate sensor. There was five of those delivered to the project. Uh, four of the cycle uh, phosphate uh, sensors were also delivered to the project. And we did deliver some uh, cycle ammonium uh, sensors to the project for some early initial deployments, but as Tom mentioned, uh, due to some technical challenges on the ammonium chemistry, uh, we, we ceased uh, providing more of those prototypes and felt it was better to focus on the nitrate and phosphates for the project. We also uh, took on some work to further develop some quality assurance, quality control flags for these nutrient sensors. In particular, we focused quite extensively on the cyclophosphate sensor. Uh, as Adam will discuss, uh, we took on some servicing and did all the servicing for all these uh, nutrient sensors. Part of that was to make sure we got a very good understanding of the challenges and the performance of these instruments um, over the uh, three-year deployment series. Uh, we also delivered uh, some of the uh, consumable reagents needed for the phosphate sensor and um, conducted a series of trainings um, with uh, a lot of the integrator uh, operators. And of course, participating in workshops and meetings and reports. So next slide. So the two uh, sensors that um, uh, Tom mentioned again is the uh, spectral uh, light um, absorption nitrate-based uh, sensor called the SUNA sensor. Uh, the phosphate was a, the cycle uh, phosphate sensor. Um, one of the things that uh, we had the opportunity to leverage as part of this grant is um, taking some of the learnings and early learnings, uh, not only from our customer base, but also from this project on where some improvement areas were needed on both sensors. And as uh, we worked through the project, we were able to make a series of modifications to both uh, the sensor platforms to really improve their performance. Uh, one of the big uh, improvements on the uh, nitrate sensor was um, to convert uh, to a new titanium housing. What we found is that there was some slight uh, humidity ingress that could go through the plastic housings. and. Uh, this was ameliorated um, through converting it to a titanium housing. On the uh, cycle side, uh, we took a lot of learnings from our original cycle um, sensor platform um, and made some changes to the fluidic system to really improve the sensor performance and ability to uh, use the fluidic sense, uh, sensing system in a more reliable, robust fashion. Um, we also, again, uh, worked with the project partners to add on some QAQC. So uh, we had the good fortune to take uh, a lot of the good, great feedback from a lot of the operators and try to build that in uh, to various revisions of these two sensor platforms. Next slide. Uh, I'd like to focus uh, the next couple slides before I hand it off to Adam on some of the uh, quality control, uh, quality assurance flags for the phosphate. We did spend a lot of time um, focused on this in, in uh, the project. Uh, that was one of the underlying goals for uh, the actual nutrient observatory was to make sure that uh, we're starting to address uh, a lot of the QAQC parameters that uh, an observatory such as NERACUS will need. Um, in order to integrate these into a broader context of values. So we spent a lot of time uh, working on the QAQCs uh, flags. Most of these were initially focused on providing uh, a set of the core Todd flags, um, making sure that those were um, included in terms of the output parameters that the sensor would actually output and the software would output. 
Um, but we also <laughs> derived a set of other quality flags to make sure that uh, these were uh, informative to the operators and uh, to the data an analysts inside of Iracuse to provide confidence in the data, um, to help speed up some troubleshooting, um, particularly with the phosphate, which is a wet chemical system. Um, so it's a fluidic based system and to make sure that um, all data points are characterized um, on board the sensor and revalidated when they're post-processed. Um, the flagging system, um, there's a, a, a composite or a suite of six individual quality flags uh, out of range. I'll go into this in the next slide, if you wouldn't mind uh, jumping to the next slide. Um, the six ones are the bubble spike, again, to make sure um, it's, there's an indication when uh, bubbles may still influence the system. Uh, coefficient of variation, giving you some idea of how well the sample worked um, as it went through the fluidic chain. Uh, low signal, um, when we're up to the signal no to noise ratio, and out of range. Um, Mixing and calibration spikes also give you some indication as to how the fluidic system is working. So uh, we implemented all these uh, QA, QCs. We did training on them. And um, I think uh, overall, I think this was a very good challenge for us um, and any observatory to, to set up a, a series of QA, QC parameters that hopefully can be meaningful to giving some data confidence um, through, through these deployments. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Adam, um, who's going to focus a lot more on our service and support uh, experience. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Uh, so yes, I'm going to talk about support roles, how we work with the customer, and how customer experience uh, informs our decisions uh, when improving or uh, uh, changing best practices with the sensors. So. Uh, first, to start off with, emerging technologies provide both scientific and ch technical challenges to getting good data in the real-world conditions. More applications, the more variables and challenges we meet. Understanding applications leads to product improvement, sometimes through engineering changes, but also through best practices in deployment, application, and servicing. Uh, the customer's pain is our pain and support. Uh, so volume and turnaround are how we see this in managing our customer support cases, and our customers' challenge form a feedback loop in our understanding. Amassing those problems allows us to sort for commonalities by application and informs product managers and engineers to find the right design solution, as well as helping to address application best practices and standard operating procedures. Uh, so before we deploy an instrument, uh, what are the um, essentials for startups and, and certainly following the best practices and consulting experts and technical support for guidance and procedures and the manuals uh, for our instruments. And then after you deploy, servicing is key on the schedule to uh, keeping maintenance costs down and also uh, gaps in your data uh, to, to the minimums. Uh, and to address the uh, things when, when things go wrong, right sizing your fleet uh, definitely has some impact here. Uh, to prevent that, uh, gaps in data, you must plan to have some redundancy in sensors. Uh, I often liken this to airlines and how there has to be some padding in the fleet to minimize disruption when things go wrong. And then when problems arise, uh, telemetry metadata and QC flags give confidence and also help inform a plan of attack that, of things that you may need to address during the field service. Raw data uh, that's provided in the sensors, uh, aside from the telemetry data, will help provide additional confidence in the data and formulate technical analysis about what may be going on to address problems. Uh, I will also mention that pic pictures of your deployment uh, and your setup and ancillary data are invaluable for telling a story about what might be going on with sensors. What, my team, what is my team doing to provide uh, better support for the customer? Uh, well, in 2016, we made a mission to uh, make one team of the technical support team. Uh, we took a geologically disparate group uh, and gave them one point of contact mostly. Uh, and anywhere you uh, call a technician, they should be able to find, provide baseline support for that. Uh, and cross-training efforts have definitely got everybody up to speed on sensors that aren't necessarily based in the facility where they're working. Uh, we've instituted a unified database to manage all tech support cases. This helps 
to keep things from getting lost, but it also allows us to monitor case volume and turnaround time on those support cases. Uh, so feedback through that database uh, definitely drives continual efforts to improve design, ease of use, and sensor robustness for better software as well. Uh, and then we've also made some extensive efforts on Suna v2 service uh, to turn around the uh, service time on those and made significant gains there. Uh, I've aggregated some of that data uh, that we have in our database here. Uh, and this is uh, providing year-over-year -year support, uh, case volume, and turnaround time on the, those cases, time to close. Uh, and you can see that uh, the volume uh, goes up and then it goes down in, in turnaround time. And this is where we've clearly uh, drawn a line to product improvements that we instituted soon at TI in, in uh, 2016. And also the product revision of HydroCycle significantly uh, improving the mechanics of the sensor, ease of use, but also providing quality flags has helped my team diagnose uh, problems a lot faster rather than just pouring through raw data itself and looking for problems. We have software to help us now. So it's definitely yielded a lot of uh, uh, gains there for the customer experience. The, the uh, volume year over year has definitely gone down and so has the turnaround time on those case to close. Some challenges that we uh, uh, met that aren't unique to near coast, but uh, in large observatory problem, uh, uh, observatory platforms is uh, it's difficult to track sensor location and keep deployment dates on schedule. Uh, and there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of moving people uh, that we need to make a, uh, an effort to coordinate better with tracking sensors and services with, with observatory. And then also planning for a little bit more redundancy. The program built in at least one set of nutrient sensors as rotators. Uh, these work to, to pad out things when, when things needed to come out of the water or be serviced. Uh, there would be one to swap in. Uh, successes and improvements, Andrew spoke extensively on uh, the technology, but I will say that the Seabird boot camp trainings were very impactful uh, with the customer. It got all the uh, organizations from the universities together to work with me in a collaborative environment and work with their colleagues with the subject matter expert on on site to help them work through problems uh, and, and get up and running as best as they could with good data. Uh, sensor improvements, of course, the hydrocycle fluidics were improved drastically to reduce the effects of bubbles on measurement and then also filter surface area was increased. Uh, to enable longer term deployment capabilities where we might encounter a lot of suspended solids. Uh, contracts for uh, programmatic buys and, and reagents, we do now offer uh, reagent contracts and that allows for a lot of cost planning and scheduling uh, benefit to the customer. And of course the sensor improvement with double piston O-rings and titanium housing as Andrew spoke about uh, helped to address the humidity ingress and we've also uh, improved a little bit on, on adaptive sampling rates with life where we have optically dense waters from CDOM interference or, or NTU and also the qualifiers on metadata QC have been defined uh, more extensively. So it's been a really enriching uh, experience. This is why I like my job is working with uh, folks at NIRACUS and other observatory platforms and I, I've, it's been a very fulfilling experience for me and my team has really enjoyed working with the folks there. So I'm going to turn this back over to Andrew for his. Uh... Yeah, I just wanted to to uh, echo the same comments. It was a, a fantastic experience to get to work with a, a very diverse and exceptionally uh, skilled set of um, both scientists and operators. And uh, we greatly appreciated the opportunity to uh, be a part of the program and, and help to get us to the goal of seeing if these uh, nutrient observations are uh, ready to be uh, further integrated and pushed out to other potential ocean observing systems. So with that, uh, just say thank you again and turn it back over to Tom. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Adam. Um, at this point, I think I'm going to move on to the next series of presentations. Uh, please feel free to type in questions um, and then we'll we'll get to questions at the end. Um, so, uh, next up, you're going to hear from 
all of our sensor operators. Um, you're going to first hear from Tom Gregory from the University of New Hampshire, then Kay Howard Strobel from the University of Connecticut, then Heather Stoffel from the University of Rhode Island, and then Dave Townsend from the University of Maine. Um, I'm not going to uh, read a bio for each of these people uh, since we have done that in the uh, previous webinar series. Um, so if you didn't get to see them, please go back and uh, view the uh, first and second uh, webinars. And so we will start uh, with Tom Gregory. And again, this series of presentations is going to talk about the, uh, the challenges and lessons learned and, and successes in operating these sensors. Thanks, Tom. This is Tom Gregory at the University of New Hampshire, and I work with Joe Salisbury to operate the Great Bay buoy in the Great Bay Estuary. Um, okay, so just a brief talk outline of what I'm going to do here today. I'll, I'll give a quick orientation to our study location and talk about some site-specific considerations for our work in Great Bay. And I'll move on to things that we do and things that we've learned about getting good data in Great Bay uh, specific to the SUNA and the hydrocycle instruments. I'll talk about what we do before the deployment, um, including uh, telemetry work, uh, the documentation from Seabird, and the SUNA calibrations. Uh, during the deployment, the importance of cleanings and validation sampling, and then afterwards, uh, SUNA post-cal and the sensor diagnostic and the QAQC flagging that uh, Andrew and Adam talked about in the previous presentation. Uh, finally, I'll show some data with some SUNA RMS error plots that I use to try and get a handle on what's what's good data and, and what's not. So uh, the Great Bay Estuary is located in coastal New Hampshire. That's the sort of region-wide map on the left and then a blow up of the Great Bay Estuary. And I've I've made my mouse as big as I could to, to try to point at things for you guys, but the buoy is this red dot here and kind of the the, the central bar, part of Great Bay proper. And we operate out of the UNH Jackson Estuarine Lab, which is on this point of land right here. And some of the site-specific considerations and advantages that we have is that we're very close to the buoy. It's, you know, maybe a less than a 10-minute boat ride out to the buoy so we're able to get out and clean it and sample it and we do have real-time telemetry at our station uh let's see moving on so uh again briefly uh here's a picture of the great bay buoy and it's operated at unh by the ocean process analysis lab uh funded by Niracuz, and we've had this buoy out in great bay in ice three months since 2005. Okay, so uh, before deployment, what's important? Well, first of all, I want to give a, a shout out to the Seabird guys um, for customer support and their software. You've heard a lot about the improvements they've tried to make to the customer experience, and as a customer, um, they're doing a fantastic job. So thanks, guys. Uh, they're very accessible. They're very competent. Um, but my next bullet, uh, read the fantastic manual. Um, you might not even have to call them because the manuals for these instruments are truly fantastic. They're basically living documents that are updated based on feedback from customers and from their own work. Um, and I find them to be superior to many of the other manuals that I find out out there. Um, so also before deployment, um, if it's possible for you to have telemetry with your system, in addition to being able to provide real-time data to your stakeholders, Telemetry lets you keep an eye on things, both the actual concentrations of the nutrients and some of the diagnostics that come through, like those QAQC flags and some of the diags that come through from, from SUNA. Um, one of the challenges that we faced was actually getting the instruments to talk through our buoy. And so for a program who's going to implement some of these sensors, I can't stress enough how important it is to make sure that you give enough time to get these sensors um, integrated into your system, get them on telemetry so that you can really pay attention. Also before deployment, we uh, it's important to do a DI water calibration in the SUNA. This is all detailed in the manual, but doing a calibration uh, hopefully would minimize any offset that you may see. And a consideration with the hydrocycle phosphate sensor is to Communicate with Seabird, 
make sure you're going to be able to get reagents when you need them for your deployment. Uh, don't don't wait too late for that. So moving on uh, during deployment, um, you know, again, I I keep an eye on telemetry. I I look at it at home. It's it's the first thing I do when I come in, and if my telemetry is not working, I I make sure to go out and fix it. And some of the things that I'm keeping an eye on, in addition to just absolute concentrations, are that the SUNA outputs an, a root mean square error value for each of its measurements. And it seems that when that exceeds about three and a half times 10 to the negative four, we start to see some problems. And I have some plots to, to highlight that a bit later. Um, you want to keep your eye on the internal humidity of the SUNA as well. This has been mitigated by the titanium upgrade that we went through, and I have some, some data to show kind of before we did that upgrade and, and, and after. Um, the hydrocycle, you keep an eye on the values, of course, but also the, the real-time flags that Andrew was discussing. Uh, the second thing that is important during deployment is to collect regular validation samples. Uh, we visit our station roughly weekly, sometimes a little bit more often during the, the heavy biofiling time. and I also try and get out there, I'm paying attention to data, and I try and get out there when I see values increase or decrease, uh, just to kind of validate that that's real and to give a little bit more dynamic range to my validation plots. We are, in Great Bay, we're easily able to get underwater and clean and inspect the instruments, make sure they're not fouled either with something growing on them or wrapped up with eelgrass or, or whatever, and we are able to do that with snorkeling or with scuba diving. It's more difficult for us to retrieve the instruments and bring them topside to work on them, but I, I know a number of colleagues who, who are able to do this. They go out regularly, they pull the instruments up, um, maybe even do a cal or check the calibration of the SUNA, and uh, that's that sort of stuff, again, is, is all detailed in the manuals. So after deployment, um, you're going to do a SUNA post-cal or where, where you're verifying the calibration. Again, this is, this is all detailed in the manual. And just uh, that's, that's something that ends up being really helpful for correcting any drift in the SUNA or any offset that you may see between SUNA values and your validation samples. Um, we run the hydrocycle data through the through the software, uh, the CycleHost software, and look at those QA, QC flags to try and get at what's what's good data, when what's and 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 maybe which which points are flagged as suspect or bad that we can actually recover because you know we we actually believe them. Um, you're going to look at your validation samples, and for nitrate, you can use those for offset correction in concert with the um, with the calibrations and post calibrations and just to validate the, the values that you're getting from nitrate. A big thing to keep in mind with the SUNA is that its detection limit is two micromolars plus or minus two micromolar. So um, if you're getting validation samples that are within that range, your data are probably good. And uh, you know, same thing with the phosphate. You're, you're using your validation samples in conjunction with the uh, QEQC flagging and the instrument cow spike uh, to verify your data. Uh, okay, so moving on to some data. This is, just to orient you to my plots here, this is 2016 hydrocycle data, which is the, the phosphate sensor. I've got time in 2016 on the x-axis and phosphate concentrations in micromolar on the y-axis. Uh, in the spring deployment, we had filters that clogged very rapidly. You can kind of see, I'm going to use my mouse to, to point at things. You can kind of see the, the, the beginning deployment data look pretty clean, and then things start to get a bit noisy. Uh, the validation samples do fall within the cycle data. Um, I don't have a plot of what the QAQC flagging looks like, but it's it's kind of a rainbow effect in this this cloud. There's there's definitely some good data, but, but there's some bad points too. And then for the second deployment, um, a bit of an offset with with some of the validation data, but but most of these data seem pretty good up until this cloud right here, um, and we basically just ran out of um, we we ran out of reagent, but we weren't able to go recover the, the instrument quite yet. 
And on the bottom is a validation plot. So on the y-axis is the hydrocycle phosphate. The x-axis shows my validation numbers. And um, you know, ex except for this point on the left here, things things look pretty good. You have to look at the y-axis scales. They're they're very small, um, but the the hydrocycle worked worked quite well most of the time in 2016. Uh, I was talking about humidity and RMSE values on the SUNA, and so this plot shows time in 2016 on the x-axis. On the y-axis, I've got nitrate concentration in micromolar, and the each individual data point is color-coded according to its RMS error value. And so when things start to get into the green is when the RMSE error is increasing to the point where maybe we want to you know, toss out a value or or consider it suspect. So you can see that uh, you know the first deployment, um, pretty much all dark blue, looks pretty good. And then this is before we had the titanium upgrade, so we were getting humidity ingress all throughout the year. It's getting you know uh, colors are getting warmer and and warmer. Uh, the offset is increasing. And you can see some of the kind of outlier points back when the data were were better. Were, um, had sort of higher RMSE relative to the other samples um, right around that, that time frame. So those are samples that we'd be able to, um, to confidently reject. Uh, down on the bottom is a similar validation plot. Um, looks, looks pretty good. Y equals 1.4X plus 3. So we had a, an, an offset of 3. So um, we may consider using uh, calibration, post-calibration, and validation sample data to correct that offset and bring the SUNA values down uh, more in line with the validation samples. And Okay, uh, 2017 data, similar deal, uh, same kind of plot with the color-coded RMSE values, and this is where in the beginning of the year our sensor had high humidity. Um, even though high humidity and high RMSE E values, we, we still see the validation samples that support the trend in nitrate, although there's a significant offset. Now, right where it turns blue, we were using a loner SUNA while ours got upgraded, and we got it back, um, but the calibration that I had was a bit funky, so we had, we had kind of a negative offset that, that we should be able to pull up. Uh, pull the sensor out of the water, and started to get some more reasonable uh, validation agreement. However, later in the year, as nitrate increased, as, as you'd expect in the fall, in which we showed last week, uh, we started to run into some, some wiper issues, which is where we start to see the colors from the RMSE air warm a bit and, and start to maybe get some, some suspect data. Uh, validation plot on the bottom again, and this is, this is for the whole year, so it, it might be a little more uh, informative to, to look at it by deployment, but this is this is kind of the whole sausage plot right here. And that's what I have for today. Um, happy to answer any questions right now, or please contact me with an email offline as needed. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. At this point, uh, let's go over to uh, Kay. Okay. Can you see me? Am I there? Yes, you are. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, I'm here at University of Connecticut. I work with Jim O'Donnell. Um, we have a buoy network in Long Island Sound, and I'm going to talk about our challenges, which is actually more environment related, and our successes um, that we've come into. Um, this is our area of operation, Long Island Sound. Um, our focus is on the western end. Um, our nutrient sensors these past two years have been deployed on our western Long Island Sound buoy, um, located here. Oops, um, hold on, sorry. Um, give me a second. Okay, here we go. Um, our nutrient sensors over the past years have been located on the Western Long Island Sound buoy. We have a buoy at Execution Rocks. We have a buoy 
at the edge of the hypoxia region in the western end of Long Island Sound. This is about where the five milligram per liter hypoxia um, oxycline is located. Uh, it's a research buoy because if anything's going to improve in the western end, we would probably see it at the edge of the hypoxic region. And then we have the central Long Island Sound buoy, which is more or less like our control buoy. Um, Long Island Sound, as we all know, is highly urbanized. We have millions of people within 50 miles of the coast, and we have a billion dollar economy based on the waters of Long Island Sound. So managing these waters, keeping an eye on nutrient levels, hypoxic levels, um, are extremely important. Um, our current status of the observatory buoys um, coming for this upcoming sampling season, we always sample temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen at all four buoys. That's like our bread and butter. The nutrient sensors um, this year will be um, at the surface on execution rocks. It will only be nitrate. And then with the nitrate to help us understand the dynamics, we are uh, deploying fluorescence and turbidity. Western Long Island Sound has nitrate, phosphate, and also will be adding a fluorescence and turbidity sensor. Um, Art G at the surface, nitrate, and an uh, eco sensor, and the same at Central. Um, Western Long Island Sound has only had, is the only one with um, phosphate. Uh, and then new also the past year or the past year has been um, looking at ocean acidification. That's the subject of another talk, and that's at Western Long Island Sound Bottom. Um, as you can imagine, um, if we go back and look at this chart, all those checks mean all these sensors. These are the Seabird 37s that we use, um, our bread and butter. It helps us interpret what we pick up from. Here's our cycle phosphate. And this is a cycle ammonium, but as you've heard, um, the cycle ammonium had technical issues, so we no longer own that or have it deployed. These are the new eco uh, fluorescence and turbidity sensors that will be going out to help us interpret our nitrate data. This is a PCO2 sensor down at the bottom, a CCAT, a seabird CCAT that will be going out at the bottom, pH sensors, and then um, the nitrate sensor with it titanium housing. A lot of sensors, um, a lot of time and effort. Um, oops. And as you can imagine, a lot of buoys um, that need to be set up and deployed, maintained, brought in, turned around, and put back out. Um, as Tom mentioned, we have to integrate all these, um, get them working, get them talking back to us. The main point here is high frequency sampling, transmitted in real time, and we need to be able to power all of these things. We get them mounted on the buoy. Um, here is a nitrate sensor um, on the bottom frame, seabird sensor. We also collect current meter data, that's an ABCP. In the back here, you can see the cyclophosphate. I think I have a better picture of that. There's the cyclophosphate mounted. One of the things we have learned with all these many different instruments is to try and keep our brackets and mounts consistent so that when we send divers down, um, they can use the same technique to take off and put on a sensor. Um, so we have all these. You'll see that one in my um, subsequent pictures. We all have this variation of two clamps on a sensor um, easily swapped out by a diver. Here's, a, um, here's the SUNA nitrate with the older style housing, also with that uh, standardized bracket. Um, Seabird and an ADCP, all clean and shiny. Um, this is our um, wire down to the bottom. We have a mid sensor at uh, Western Long Island Sound. Here's our bottom sensors attached to chain and then an anchor. Uh, this is just a close-up of um, a bottom sensor at Execution Rocks. Again, a slightly modified bracket, very important for divers when we go out there, and the mount on which it goes.
uh, just a close-up of our Seabird 37s. We get four instruments down at the bottom of Western Long Island Sound. We get it deployed, we come back to the lab, and what do we say? Well, a lot of the time we see lots of green, but yeah, there's red here, and that's not a good sign. Um, something's happened, and as Tom mentioned, keep an eye on it, and then we have to run down and see. Uh, Central Long Island Sound um, is right in the middle of the sound. We are dependent on cellular communications. Because we live in an urbanized estuary, when cellular communication bandwidth um, is used up, the bubble around our uh, buoy gets small and we have hard times talking. And then as the bandwidth of cellular communications drops off, typically approximately two to four in the morning, we have very good communications with the central sound buoy. Um, when this data comes back in real time, um, what do we see? Uh, this was with our earlier um, phosphate sensor and we had the bubble issue and the filter clogging. And as Andrew mentioned, they changed that. Um, so that's not so much, but we see these things, we lose communications, we get bad data coming in, and then we try and get out there. Well, we can't always get out there because sometimes it's foggy, sometimes there's fronts, sometimes there's storms. But when we do finally get out there, our biggest um, issue is the biofouling. Um, and here is um, sensors I've had the divers bring up because they're sending back bad data in real time um, because they're covered. Um, here's more pictures of biofouling. We've got oysters growing on our um, nitrate sensor. We've got barnacles in there. Um, this was the CSAT uh, pH sensor on the bottom. Um, Corpidulas um, get in everywhere. Uh, this was the PCO2 sensor. Um, just biofouling is uh, a problem. This is um, biofouling inside the copper guard on our CFET sensor. This is fouling on the bottom of our phosphate sensor. That's the filter in which the water comes in. Not as bad, but still covered. This is the pH sensor. Um, stuff gets in on the pH, and then sometimes uh, just the connector fails. So we go and we recover these things, and this is what we see. Uh, muscles all over. Uh, muscle set can be all over. Um, hydroids. Uh, as uh, Seabird has gone to great effort to help with this um, biofouling, and we can deploy the Seabirds for it very long periods of time because the important thing here is that copper guard and then here is where the uh, pump intakes are and there is uh, biofouling collars right there. So despite the fact that this whole sensor was covered in um, muscles, we had great data coming in. Uh, just more picture, uh, more of the same, or that could be a duplicate. Um, another problem with muscle sets is um, the weight of the muscle. It can snap the cables, it torques the cables. Not just muscles, not just uh, hydroids, but we also get um, kelp all over the buoys. Uh, not just biofouling. We also have issues because we're in an urbanized estuary and because we're sampling in warm weather and because uh, that would be the height of the summer recreational season. Even though we put signs on the buoys, um, we still get fishermen. This is a 12-inch lure. It had steel wire on it. Um, and then this was our PCO2 sensor. It could happen to any sensor. Um, totally scraped up. And it actually fell off the bottom mount. Um, and we had divers find it about 100 feet downstream of the buoy. Um, and then just not um, fisher, uh, fishermen or recreational fishermen um, or biofouling. Sometimes we have birds, and I don't have a picture of it, but I do have where one of our – oh, all these buoys, by the way, do have med stations atop, which are very valuable in assessing nutrient dynamics and what's going on, as well as valuable to the user community. Um, but we do have uh, birds that have occasionally knocked these anemometers and the cellular antenna off or over. 
Um, ice is an issue in the winter. Uh, this is a good winter. Typically, um, we just get ice on the uh, top of the buoys, and we get warm and cold. One of the problems is, though, that because it's warm and cold, the ice kind of slushes around and can break the connectors. It can block the solar um, charging that takes place. And if you see here on the central um, buoy, this is Central Long Island Sound, the deck of the buoy is now um, flush with the surface. Uh, okay, this is Tom. Yep. Uh, sorry to interrupt Almost you, done. but we're we're running over time. So yeah, if you could just please wrap up. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, this is a bad winter. Execution rocks. Another bad winter. Western destroys the buoys, cuts the cables, uh, lines snap. We have to go retrieve buoy sensors snap. This is our um, buoy that ended up at uh, City Island. Execution rocks drift down to City Island. Um, we're not sure what happened here. So what do we do? How do we fix this? Well, in the late winter, we go and haul the buoys. Biofouling is still a problem. How do we fix that? Well, as has been mentioned several times, redundant sensors is the best way to fix that. Um, and we send our divers down and we swap out the sensors. Can't always get there, but we try. Um, these are our um, validation points that we take to try and verify. And as been mentioned by uh, Andrew and Adam, the QAQC that is now built in helps us interpret. Um, here's a bad data point. Um, over here, it's telling us it's suspect. This helps us interpret, and then here's at the beginning of our data. Um, that helps us as well. Bottom line is, despite all those problems, despite the environment, it's no longer the instrument, it's primarily the environment. We get back long time series that we're able to summarize, see how the current state of water quality compares when it comes back in real time. We're developing these long time series of nitrate data that can be used to better assess um, how to manage Long Island Sound, which is a billion dollar economy. Um, and I'll let you all read that. I'm done, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Kay. So uh, uh, apologies, we're running a little bit over time. Um, there's a, a lot of information um, here from this project that we want to share with you. I'm just gonna switch the order up a little bit because I know uh, Dr. David Townsend is going to have to leave us at two o'clock. So uh, we're going to go to Dave first, uh, then we'll go to Heather. Okay, thanks, Tom. I, I think I'm up, correct? Are you seeing my screen? Yes, you are. Yep, it okay, looks good. Okay, so I'll, this, this won't take long. Uh, I just want to go over a few problems we've had with our sunas that have been deployed at these at these buoys. We we put them in, inside these racks made of aluminum. You can see they, that that attach to the buoy lines uh, that hang below the surface. You got the suna, the battery, the inductive modem, uh, and it's coupled with the temperature and salinity. And um, why am I not? There we go. And so we, here, here's a, a set of them ready to go out, uh, be put on a truck, go on the ship, and, and uh, be deployed. Uh, just quickly to go over the pre-deployment uh, sensor calibration in the lab. Uh, this is a couple of examples of early uh, in-the-lab calibrations against our auto analyzer and, uh, you know, spot on. And so we stopped using all of those low concentrations. And I'm just going to quickly go through these. And you can see that every one of these pre-cruise calibrations with four points are uh, pretty impressive to say the least. One of the problems we have as well, of course, is the fouling. Uh, this is an unprotected SUNA after about six weeks at the surface uh, on one of the ESP moorings as part of another project. And you can see the hydrozones are growing inside the uh, slot there as well as on the brush. Uh, another view of the same, same instrument. And this one, you hold, hold these things just right and you're steady with your camera, you can actually look inside and you can see that these hydroids are growing across the lens itself uh, inside the optical chamber where the measurements are being taken, which seems to me uh, could be a problem. And this is with a brush that's working at the surface. 
another view of the same thing, et cetera. Uh, this is what the brush itself looks like at one, one of our surface buoys. Uh, I'm not sure which one. Uh, I think this may be, I don't know what this is more. Do you know what it is? Uh, yeah, anyway, you, you can see it's, it's a mess inside there uh, with a brush. Now, these, these buoys stay out for a year. So uh, it's not too surprising that they get to be uh, so so foul. So the solution we, we've adopted is um, for the ones that are shallow and have a brush, you know, we just put copper everywhere. We wrap it around the piece of aluminum below it. We've got it on the little handle of the brush here, uh, either side of the brush, and j just copper everywhere we, we can think of. And then the ones that are too deep for a brush, we came up with a system where we we put a couple of uh, PVC rings, and then we surround it with a layer of copper screening, followed by a layer of 20 micron Nitex mesh, and then another layer of copper screening. And we space them out here so that the surface area of our screening and mesh is relatively large relative to the volume of water that it has to pass through to go into the sensor. So. Uh, Anyway, uh, we didn't know what else we could do, so we've tried this. It seems to work okay. Um, now, the other thing, the other problem we have is with uh, field calibrations, where we, or in other words, to get the offset. So here's a couple of examples out at Buoy M, uh, a, a CTD cast with bottles for nutrients, and I'm just showing. Uh, what am I showing? A nitrate and silicate, but nitrate with the black dots is all you need to look at. So here's a here's just before the buoy goes in the water, then just after the buoy goes in the water. And then we we look at these values uh, and and see what the what the correction has to be. And you can see they're pretty good, but there is some offset uh, periodically in these. But the offset, my warning to all of you, I guess, is is shown in this last slide, which is uh, I'm questioning the value of field calibrations or bottle sam uh, water samples we take <coughs> out at sea and send back. Here's an example of uh, assuming we have at 50 meters out here on buoy I. And here's a station that was done on October 7th. It uh, doesn't matter the time of day. And so blue here is nitrate, red is silicate. And you can see, and, and the values are zero to 10 here. And you can see that the nitrate is, is very much higher than the, the silicate on October 7th. And then we come back and get ready to put the buoy in. And in it goes. And now the nitrate is almost the same as silicate. And then uh, 10 hours later, we repeat the cast, and now the silicate's greater than the nitrate. So we start out, nitrate's greatly higher, much higher than the, than the silicate, then they're equal, and then they flip. And so, you know, it's, what do you do? So we've, we've just chosen to believe the data. That's it. I'm finished. Okay, thank you, Dave. Okay, so we'll switch over to Heather. And I see right now we're uh, almost at two o'clock. Again, apologies for going over. Um, if you need to sign off, we understand. Um, but if you can stay on, uh, Heather's gonna talk a little bit about her lessons learned. Then we'll hear from Riley about um, accessing data and we'll try to take a few questions. Thank you. Okay, so I work with uh, Laura Reed here at uh, GSO on uh, the nutrient centers for this project. Laura headed up the phosphate data and uh, we both worked on the SUNAS. So uh, this is part of a, uh, in Narragansett Bay, part of the Narragansett Bay fixed site monitoring network where we have several buoys in the um, network. The two, the, we have four stations with SUNAS. Two of them uh, report to Massachusetts. Those were put in as a test in the fall of 2016 and started reporting regularly to Massachusetts in 2017 and 18. The GSO dock station, which is down here, that's a dock station. And that one, we have an old SUNA a V1 there that we started to try to deploy in 2017. We had uh, icing issues, as Kay mentioned, and it um, damaged the cable. So we had to get that replaced. So we tried to get it out again for the summer, um, but we had other issues with the cable um, working in the fall, some late summer, fall of 2018. So um, that actually damaged the SUNA, so it had to be sent back in for repair, and we've gotten that back, so everything is operational as of the beginning of March of this year. 
then the Greenwich Bay Station um, is the one for this project. And we had the Suna V2 with the plastic housing. And we, same as Tom mentioned, we had some communication issues that we had to work out. We finally got that operational in June 2018. And then our biggest issue there with the Suna was data gaps because uh, we were trying to get the relative humidity to report in real time. So um, the, the main issue there was we had another gap, data gap in early October trying to uh, work out those, those issues in real time. And the same thing with the phosphate sensor, we had issues with that reporting in real time. So um, that we hopefully have resolved and we plan to get back in the water in April 2019. And then, so we do all vertical um, deployments. They're hung, this is Greenwich Bay Station. It's hung with our surface on. Um, we wrap everything in copper tape. We've also used this PVC tape, which works just as well as the copper tape. It's a little bit cheaper and it's a little bit thicker, so it's easier to get on and off. Sometimes the copper tape over time, it um, kind of adheres, the glue adheres to the, the instrument, so it's hard to get off. So um, this, PVC tape that we found works fairly well. So we wrap everything basically except for the little slot where the wiper, where the optics are and where the wiper uh, goes through. And so we do the same for the vertical mounts and the buoys and um, the same uh, vertical mount for the GSO dock, which goes through a hole in the floor in a uh, shed on the dock. And I mentioned our cables. We've had some issues with cables bending at the top, even though they're vertically mounted. And um, that's caused not damage. We haven't had any damage to the V2s yet, but we've had uh, damage to the V1. And uh, as Adam mentioned, we plan on having duplicate cables and we um, do duplicate wipers. So we've, after this experience, we've come up with a sampling schedule of every two weeks. We go out to the stations and service them. Um, and at that time, the wiper is fouled, then we will replace the wiper um, at that two-week schedule. We've had fouling issues, just as everybody's mentioned. The V1 does not have the wiper capability, so that one gets fouled fairly quickly. And so for that one, since we don't have any other, we have four parameters that report, and that's it. It's the um, micromolars, milligrams, um, micrograms per liter. Then we've got the light and the dark uh, readings to guide us. So uh, we've been using the, the light readings. If we start to see a steady decline in those, then we try to get out there before the two weeks and, and service that instrument. That's just for the V1. And then once a month, we try to take our DI water and we do a parafilm technique, wrap it around, try to make sure there's no bubbles and uh, check against um, the DI water reading to make sure it's reading close to zero. And um, We'd like to do that more, but it doesn't always work out because the rocking of the boat, we've had bubbles. And so some instances we've had bad issues, but it's more of the parafilm technique that we, we got to uh, really work out. And uh, we also had sampling inter interval issues, which going into 2019, we've had a consensus that we're going to use a one hour sampling for all of our SUNAs. The um, phosphate sensor, again, will also be a one-hour sampling schedule. And so for the QAQC uh, data and the metadata for Greenwich Bay, since that was part of this project, that will be uh, delivered through the New Yorkers website. And then presently, we're work trying to work on a QAP for the Narragansett Bay Fixed Site Monitoring Network to include the SUNA at this point. And some of those protocols that we're developing are the one-hour sampling rate, uh, the grab samples on a bi-monthly, servicing bi-monthly. Um, we'll, for servicing at V1, we use the uh, drift in the light, and then um, we do a calibration check monthly at our service schedule. And then we're also trying to develop um, the, uh, data quality flags. Uh, any negative values get flagged. Uh, the, as Tom had mentioned earlier, the calibration offsets, we look at those graphically, and um, our biggest has been um, missed time readings, time, time stamps, random readings, and large chunks of data due to issues. So just documenting all those in the metadata is where we're at. 
and that's about it for me. Thank you, Heather. Um, so that completes the uh, section on some of the challenges and lessons learned. And I do want to uh, go over to Riley now from the Gulf Maine Research Institute. So Riley Young Morris is the program manager for the Ocean Data Products team at the Gulf Maine Research Institute. She leads a team of software developers who specialize in the design and development of data-driven information tools from ocean observing data. The team has served as the data management communications DMAC lead for NIRACUS since its inception, managing the process of integrating regional sensor data and developing decision support tools for stakeholders. Riley has an educational background in marine science and fisheries, as well as experience leading product development for a main based software company. She has a strong interest in designing and developing interactive data visualizations from complex data sources. Okay, over to Riley, please. Hi, can you hear me now? <laughs> yep, we can hear you, Riley. Sorry, I was double muted. Um, thanks, Tom. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you guys a bit about the work we did on the project to uh, integrate and process the data coming out of these deployments and then um, optimally make the data available to people interested in it. Um, so just quickly, I only have a couple of slides and then we're going to get right to the data, but um, the goals, our goals for the project were to integrate the data from the sensors that were deployed throughout the region, as you've learned. Um, and it, you know, obviously, it was a mix of coastal and offshore sensors, and we want to make that data accessible to end users. So those are our kind of two high-level goals. And as you've learned through the talk so far, um, the platforms are distributed and managed by operators at University of Maine, University of New Hampshire, University of Rhode Island, and University of Connecticut. So um, that requires sort of independently working with each group to make sure that we're handling their data. So uh, first we needed to set up a process to acquire and integrate the data. And we do that pretty regularly with um, kind of our standard array of sensors and buoys. But as you, again, you've learned these aren't, these these data were not as straightforward for a couple of reasons as some of our standard um, physical data where we can typically survive, uh, typically provide them in near real time as provisional with sort of minor corrections when the buoys are deployed and, and brought back to the um, to the buoy stations. These data were sort of experimental, so there was a lot of work that needed to be done on understanding the quality of the data and how the data were calibrated. So it was sort of this additional step in processing kind of really QA, QC files of the data. Um, so to make the data accessible, we wanted to use our, um, in our near acoustic data management system, the ERDAP platform, and if you haven't ever seen it, you're about to get a quick overview. We don't have a whole lot of time, but you'll get a little exposure to it. And what ERDAP is, is a um, sort of as defined by its developers, it's a data server that gives you a simple, consistent way to download subsets of gridded and tabular data sets in common file formats. And so this essentially allows us to put data from all kinds of different sources and sensors together and make it the same process for you to go uh, query and understand it and download it. Um, it has some limitations, which we'll talk a little bit about, and then uh, what we're doing with it is sort of using ERDAP as a kind of a back-end platform to provide data into other um, applications and data tools. So I'm going to hop us over, hopefully cleanly, over to ERDAP now. Um, I think you can see. And so... Uh, this is the standard screen. You'll see this is this is where the ERDAP server lives. Um, when you get there for the NIRCUS server, and we uh, we have a lot of data sets. We've got uh, closing in on 200, and I think probably we're going to hit a lot more than that by the <laughs> by the end of this year at least. Um, and so you can see we've got data for all the buoys, um, the different um, monitoring platforms, different platform package or uh, sensor packages that go with the buoys, and what ERDAP gives us. Um, are a couple of ways to get in there a little more quickly. So we have a simple search, which I'm going to do for you right now. So these, the data that we've got from the project that we're going to spend a little time on are the SUNA, um, SUNA data from the different, we have a lot of the University of Maine data and some data from the other providers. We will look at the data sets from Maine um, and just want to quickly walk you through 
what you can see here. So when you first decide and choose a data set, so we're going to look at the Bowie E SUNA um, data, and this is the corrected data file. We have a couple of options right off the bat. We can do a quick graph. And so this basically, ERDAP looks at the data set, the time series, and generates kind of an initial graph, which we have some control over. So right now it's just about a month of data. But some of the information it gives you, and um, it's one of these things where it's not real, super easy to find everything, but once you understand how it works, it's your next your next interaction with ERDAP is a lot cleaner. So up here I can see this is the uh, this is the time band of my data set. So it's giving me a month of data, um, and I could go back and you know look sort of at the original deployment, which was June. And then just redraw that graph. So now I'm looking at the entire data set. So again, a quick plot, not the prettiest plot you've ever seen, but it gives you a sense of of the data that you're you're getting from this time series. If we go back to our tabular form here, um, what the way this is laid out, if you imagine a spreadsheet or a database, this is a this is a column and rows scenario where these are the the parameters um, in the columns, and each observation would be essentially a row. So we can go through this data set and again see that it's bound by this time range, 2015 to 2018, and some of the other limits like the min max for some of these parameters. And you could you could say I only want to look at you know a small window of the data or I want to look at the whole data set. And so you have some control over filtering. Um, you know, you could choose to not show every time parameter. We've got sort of the main one here, we can turn these off. Um, and then for file type, the quickest way to look at the data is just to allow it to print for you in this um, HTML table, data table. Um, and that, you know, again, you can sort of scan quickly and see what you're what you're getting from this time series. But what's pretty great about ERDAP um, are all the options you have for downloading. So these are the file formats that would convert that data into. So depending on what your needs were, how you wanted to work with the data you have, anywhere from a CSV file to, to NetCDF to MATLAB, um, and it'll just uh, transform that data. So it's, again, a, a pretty pretty robust backend, and it has features where uh, users can come in and get what they need with data, but then it also provides data either through X output file types or as web services. So um, one of the examples I wanted to show you, and I just stole my own punchline here because it's already loaded the graph, um, this is an example of one of the um, interactive uh, tools that we like to use in the, in the products we're building, and this is a high charts um, product. And so I can, I'll make it more exciting. I will go to a different buoy. Um, so now I've chosen buoy I. I can see that I have temperature, salinity, density, and then my uh, concentration of nitrate. So, and I can choose the corrected nitrate. Um, and again, I get the sort of available time range for that data set. Um, I do have to make one little correction here. It's going to blow up. Um, and then it'll basically replot the data for me. What high charts gives us is a little more control over the look and feel and the output of these plots. So again, you can kind of look at the, look at a one year deployment. You can look at the whole time series. You could look at the last month. And so we have a lot more flexibility in um, working with the data. And then just quickly, where we're going with this, so we're at the stage where everybody's kind of done their experimental work with the data, they understand the sensors, they understand their correction and calibrations, they're producing their final um, calibrated data sets. Once those are all kind of in our, in our system, then we've got the components we need to build out um, more, more sort of explicit tools for stakeholders to get at the nutrient data. And I just wanted to quickly show a product that we're working on with Neracuse. This is um, kind of a evolution of the, the sort of primary buoy data map, but we could, you know, potentially do something like this with the nutrient observatory data where you could look at the temperature, salinity, nutrient, any other parameters that make sense to kind of group together um, and sort of organize them in kind of a more comparative way. So. Again, just to kind of hit on the, the sort of things we can put on top of a NerdApp server that allow us a lot more flexibility with the data. And then um, 
ERDAP app itself is kind of that interim step if you if you wanted to do some uh, additional processing or, or um, analysis of, of these data sets they they become easy to access and available to you um, and that is all I have so I'm going to just end it on my thank you slide all right thank you Riley and thank you everybody for um, sticking around again apologies for going over the time um, I will uh, Try to take some questions. Um, and again, if you need to sign off, please feel free to sign off. Um, but we'll uh, take a few questions. So um, there's one question for all the presenters. Um, how do people deal with the offset of data? How do people integrate bottle matchups? If doing a linear fit, do you use all the points to perform a single fit and apply that offset to all? Any of the operators want to answer that question? This is Tom, Tom Gregory. Um, it, we, I think we take it as a deployment by deployment basis in, instead of kind of the whole year plots that I showed, um, but that's very much a work in progress, uh, I think, for all of us. Thanks, Tom. Uh, there's another question. Can you explain how you calculate the root mean square error? This is Tom again, and that's something that the SUNA outputs for us. Um, maybe Adam or Andrew could tell us a bit more about what the sensor is actually doing. Uh, hi, this is Adam Dutton. Yeah, the, the RMSE uh, is is uh, based on a best fit for our nitrate slope. So there's an extinguishing slope between bromide being the nearest uh, uh, interfering species in seawater sea with uh, nitrogen absorption, NO2, NO3. And we just use a best fits curve to um, manage that RMSE air there. There's clear guidelines set off in the manual for um, uh, minus double lot one uh, uh, cutoff point before we start questioning the data with, whether it's valid or not. Thanks, Andrew. Another question, does everyone apply the temperature salt adjustment? Uh, this is this is Adam Dutton from Seabird again. Uh, I'm going to take the silence as a as a no, uh, but our software, uh, the UCI software, does provide uh, ingestion of of temperature and salinity to do corrections. Uh, so you can take your CTD data from uh, the the deployment, and as long as it's formatted correctly, there's guidelines in the manual, and then you load the raw data from the SUNA into the, the software along with that CTD data and we'll uh, use the temperature salinity correction algorithm. Thanks, Adam. Another question, uh, what factors contribute most to biofouling and how does biofouling vary from north to south? This is Heather. I think um, it might be more on how often you can get out to service the station. So it might be an offshore inshore thing, the inshore stations being able to being serviced more often compared to the offshore sites. Thanks, Heather. And I think uh, those are all the questions that we had. Uh, was there somebody? Else who's going to say something? Okay. Well, then that concludes our final webinar of this webinar series. Um, right here is a slide with all of our contact information on it. Uh, so if you want to follow up with anybody 
uh, with additional questions. Uh, everybody is uh, willing to uh, take questions. Also, I wanted to let you, everybody know that, you know, for our project, we will be producing a final project report, a technical report, which will have a lot of the information uh, that was shared today in that report. And again, we'll make that available on our website. This webinar uh, was recorded and also will be made available on our website. Uh, again, thank you to all the presenters and thank you to those who uh, joined us today. And that concludes the uh, NIRCUS Integrated Nutrient Observatory webinar series.